Angelos. Oh, hi. Hi, how are you? Well, not too bad. Ah, no. uh, feeling better, are you? Well, it's improving, you know. It's not up to normal. And mm -hmm. I've been, I was in the hospital yesterday. The doctor thinks I should do the uh, angioplasty, you know, that it would make me a lot better. Really? Hmm. Has that uh, medication from Switzerland ever arrived? Well, not Switzerland. It was from somewhere in Europe, wasn't it? Sweet. Sweet. Yeah, no, I have some things that I, I think that I've been helped, but, you know, it's hard to know. I'm, in, I'm improving it. I see. I know it. And when would he want to do that? The well, at this time, I suppose. I mean, I said within the next three months, but I mean, I could make it earlier if I want to. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about it? Well, it's hard to know. I mean, there's a 5% risk that it could get worse, you see. I see. I see. Uh, are you just consulting one doctor or more than one? Well, just this fellow, yes. Yeah. It's in the National Health. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the... I, it's hard to know. You see, I don't think they believe that anything can remove the plaque. On the other hand, maybe there can be something else. I see. I see. Uh, the reason but, I'm... You know, how can you tell? Why? Well, that's it. The reason I'm asking is I, I'm just I'm editing a, 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 a film right now from uh, Dr. John Wenberg. Did you know who he is? Uh, no. From Dartmouth. Uh, well, he conducted uh, a study that's become rather uh, uh, provocative here in, in, in the States uh, regarding New Haven and Boston and uh, the way various uh, cities or, or various areas approach medicine and the practice of medicine. Mm -hmm. And he chose those two particular cities because they both had renowned medical colleges at them mm -hmm. and found that the approaches were extraordinarily different. And... Um, not that one group was any better or brighter than the other. They were just patterned practices that had sort of set in. And as a result of that, he's developed another study, and he zeroed in specifically on prostatectomies. And uh, what they are doing essentially is, is comparing a, a surgery to watchful waiting. And uh, the movement... Uh, there's a very, in fact, they're using the term a paradigm shift, which he spoke about and, and said this is a, it's unusual that this term should be used in medicine. And he went into Tom Kuhn's work, who he's a, he's a follower of because he's into the philosophy of science. And he said, but the movement is, is towards uh, allowing the patient in on the decision-making that somehow the, the real answer, uh, if the patient has the proper information, the answer, as he put it, is hermetically sealed in the patient rather than the doctor. Uh, and, and in truth, I'm in the studio now putting this piece together. So uh, I'm just suggesting that, that if there's, I don't know how your, the national uh, health thing works there, but if there's an opportunity to see someone else. Uh, there isn't within that system, really. So I'd have to see privately, and the problem is, you know, to get the records and... Uh, so it, yeah. So it would cause a big, you know, in other words, I, I think they would feel offended if I... <laughs> I don't even want to go into that. <laughs> they would. <laughs> well, uh... Oh, what's, what's for the best? You see, uh, there has been an improvement, uh, uh -huh. and I think this doctor is convinced a lot more if I had to. Oh, really? Really? Well, uh, I'm sure you, you've got people, uh, good people interested in, in, in the whole situation. So I'm just, again, it's on my mind because it's, I'm literally swimming in it here, and it's causing major, major uh, waves of uh, uh, unrest throughout the entire healthcare community because more and more uh, we had one fellow who gave a speech, and he, it's a Dr. Paul Ed Elwood, who's the head, who works hand-in-hand -hand with Wenberg, and in fact is called the father of HMOs, this new form of uh, health, health insurance that's been happening here. And they have come up with uh, statistics that say anywhere from 30 to 60 percent of all things done, of all things done by well-meaning, Physicians are either unnecessary or whatever. It's it's kind of a scary situation here. Most of it is happening as a result of 
an increase in malpractice suits. So the doctors are being pressured into doing an excessive amount of uh, tests and services which really aren't necessary, many of which haven't even been tested or proven yet. So it's a, an unusual situation. Anyhow, I'm, not, I'm sure you'll <laughs> make the right determination. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not that familiar with the specific uh, angioplasty now. Is that, uh, how does that compare with the bypass situation? Well, they don't have to open you up. They put a, a, they put a catheter in your artery going to the heart. Uh -huh. And there's a, something like a balloon is blown up to press it against the oh. and flatten them out, you see. Oh, I see. Now, the danger to that is that it may affect the artery, you know. You know, perhaps while the balloon is touching, you might block the blood supply and make a heart attack, or the artery could get irritated and collapse, uh, you know. I see. Is that right? Uh, of course. Yeah, but of course it, uh, it's not, it only holds a few years because the stuff will start getting again. Oh, sure. And then they recommend another one? Or, I mean, is it possible? I so, yeah. I think you and can't I'm do I'm trying to find out if there are not cholesterol reducing drugs and so on. You see, some people say there are, and uh, these doctors don't say, but. I see. Uh, well, I can, uh, I'm, I'm working with the, the, you know, the top medical people here in the state of Pennsylvania. Just uh, explore. I'll ask them if there are any cholesterol reducing drugs or anything. Yeah, sure. There was an article in the New York Times and I was in America saying that people staying on a strict vegetarian diet, they found the plaque was reduced. Yeah. Hmm. So, with diet and drugs, is it possible to reduce the cholesterol? If you could find out any information on that, that would be helpful. I promise you I will. In fact, I will do it reduce tomorrow. The plaque. Right, I'll do it tomorrow. The reason I'll do it tomorrow is because on Tuesday I'll be leaving for Los Angeles. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, it's my son's... Well, then would you let me know as soon as you do it? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll, I'll speak to the doctors tomorrow, and uh, if, if I don't get the specific answer... There's a drug called... Uh, ask him about, particularly about a drug called Probocol. Uh, P-R-O. 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 C-U-C-O-L. Okay, I promise you I will. Yeah, and, and if, uh, if and that, that's been on, on in Canada, I know they've had it as a routine drug, and in Germany, but it, cer it certainly helps prevent depositing. And some people claim it removes some plaque. Now the, the, the thing is to check those two claims. Out. I see. And your your doctors are essentially saying that it just doesn't work that way. Well, it? they're not saying they don't really think the cholesterol is the main point. You see, they they, they say uh, that with grafts, the main cause of the uh, the main cause of uh, that's another point to check with grafts. The main cause of uh, plaque is um, the platelets, the blood vessels, the blood in the blood, right? Mm -hmm. The platelets stick. So you see, that's another point you could try to check up on. Yeah, I will. I will. Um, if I don't get all the information tomorrow, I'm going to be in touch with those offices throughout the next few days when I'm in Los Angeles. So uh, as I get the information, I will pass it on to you uh, from there. You know. The, I promise you I'll get back to you. Um, a couple of things have happened that I wanted to also relate to you. But wait, well, you could ask one more point. Please. Uh, what I'm getting from Sweden is the fish oil. Oh, and yes. 15, and and uh, there is a claim that that uh, helps to bring uh, reduce the plaque too by reducing the cholesterol. Now, you could check that whether anything is known about that. Yeah. You got all the points then? Absolutely. Uh, the, the protocol, uh, whether in fact that has any effect whatsoever, uh, and the yeah, fish oil. Well, well, it, well, it may cut down the deposit, you see, or whether it can actually remove some, right? Uh, remove some. And the second point is in the grafts and the bypass. Mm -hmm. uh, the claim was that it's uh, more likely to be uh, platelets than cholesterol. Oh, in the bypass, it's more likely to be platelets than yeah. cholesterol, which is why they're suggesting that uh, the angioplasty take place. Yeah. Uh-huh. And that you have been taking fish oil at the present time. Fish oil, but I don't think they believe in it. But I've heard evidence that the question is whether fish oil and 15 milliliters a day mm -hmm. would actually change it. It's a, it's a fairly large amount. Now, can I have the feeling that it, it has helped, but... 
just going to say, can can it be measured? To, uh, to well, the extent? only way to measure it would be to do another angiogram, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> is that is that a complex thing, an angiogram? Well, no, but it's you, you know it's unpleasant. You know, you've got to stick the probe up into the heart and Alrighty. get somebody. You know, it's not a thing that you want to do very often. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I will begin the process tomorrow, and if I get lucky and can get to a couple of doctors, I will do so to get the specific information. Uh, yeah. If I have to carry it over into uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, well, Tuesday, of course, I'll be traveling, but you'll hear from me by Wednesday. Um, yeah. uh, we'll just keep this part of the conversation going. Um, I'm wondering, do, do you know any, uh, is there anyone that you were seeing while you were in, in um, oh, hi. Any doctor? No, no. I don't know. You, I don't know of anybody there. You don't know anybody there. Okay. Well, I'll we'll look into it and we'll see what we come up with. Definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, if it, were, if it weren't for that 5% risk, I'd say it'll do it right away. Mm -hmm. He thinks it'll improve the quality of my life a great deal. Really? I'm not getting enough blood. I, I can tell I'm not getting enough blood. It's better than before, but it's not enough. And and it, that essentially is what what's slowing you down. I mean, yeah. what, what's making you tired and, and um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, I have a fairly clear. Let me just go over that. Uh, probe probe you call P R O B U C O L. And, yeah. Um, whether it would reduce the deposits. Or else prevent them from getting worse. Mm -hmm. uh, two two things. One is to stop, it, to slow down or stop the deposit from getting worse. Or second, maybe even to remove some. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the other thing is that what these doctors are saying essentially is that, that they believe in it, that it's the platelets and not the cholesterol in the, uh, the bypass that are causing the yeah. problem. taking 15 milliliters of uh, fish oil. Fish oil a day. Yeah, now, the, the blockage in the bypass is just where it joins the original, the artery, you see. And that's where the blockage is. Let me just no, put that down, too. Blockage is where? Yeah. Blockage? Just where the uh, bypass joins the original artery. You know, you know that probably there's an irregular blow pattern there and it sort of sticks there. You know. mm -hmm. And, uh, see, I, I'm, 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 obviously I, I don't know a heck of a lot regarding uh, uh, percentages, but a 5% risk factor, is, is, a, is that considered a, a large risk factor? Or, or no, it's not considered large, but it could get worse. There is a 5% risk factor that it could get worse. Between 5 and 10, he said. No, you can't estimate it too well. Um, yeah. You know, Ultimately, you know, it still comes down to your decision, which is essentially what we're right. saying. That's right. There's some danger of a clot, for example, which could be very bad. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's, uh, but I haven't had that trouble in the operation or in all these, you know. So maybe it's, one wouldn't worry about it. Uh, the the danger is uh, of, uh, either something goes wrong while you're actually putting the balloon against the artery and blocking blood, perhaps. Mm -hmm. and, or the other thing is that uh, you uh, disturb the artery and it uh, starts to collapse. Ah, I see. Now, he, the doctor tells me that the artery, is, where the joint is, the artery is stronger than usual, and that, that's a good sign. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, th 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 did you discuss time elements at all with respect to doing it or not doing it? In the well, it does uh, well, I... I mean, as far as you much. making that determination, and, and assuming that they're, they're saying that you got, you better, you better do something. What are they giving you a, a time frame? Well, it's it, no, well, in three months is what they okay. think I should make my decision. And you see, the, 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 the other point is that if it's unknown, you see, it's, there's a risk factor in not doing it because it yeah. could slowly get worse, right? right? And you could have a heart attack or, or something, you know. Have you been uh, walking every day?
every day or just doing the, your Yeah, general? I walk every day at least about a mile or two anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, I walk up hills, mile hills and stuff. You know, uh, I just see that the main symptom is no pain or anything, but rather a uh, lack of stamina compared right. with what I had. Okay, well, I've got a pretty clear picture of it now. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it might, from that picture, you could try to see whether any of these can get some answers, right? Or, or certainly at least uh, suggestions. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but, but as I say, you know, I, I guess it's depending on who you ask out there, much like it is here. But I, if I find someone... Yeah, I someone mean, you could always get an alternative medicine man who would tell you something different, but that's what knows. That's right. That's right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but he knows either, huh? It's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, the degree of the not knowing, and, and this is suddenly yeah. just becoming, uh, you know, people are becoming aware. And certainly the, the medical community is becoming aware of it yeah. and, uh, for the first time. Uh, yeah, I would have liked this doctor to have cooperated with me. He wanted to do an ex another exercise test, but mainly for the sake of convincing me I should do the operation. But I, I wanted to do it for the sake of testing whether the fish oil was working. Uh -huh. I couldn't even tell him that, right? Ah, uh, isn't that something? Well, yeah, sure. That, in, in fact, that's exactly what's going on here, that you can't get yeah. past their, their absolute... Uh, is this I mean, it would have done no harm. He could have said, if it's working, he would have learned something. If it's not working, we just say so. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. See, well, don't, <laughs> that's the whole trouble with the mind all around anyway, you see. Yes, and once it's stuck in it... Okay, Krishnamurti was talking about yeah, and and then it, it pervades all of all of uh, society, including the medical community, where they're stuck yeah. in their ways. And, uh, um, okay. Well, I'll do what I can. I promise you that. I promise you that. Uh, I have a I have a couple of things that that might bring a smile to your face. Anyhow. Have you seen Melba yet again? No, I haven't. As a matter of fact, I was going to call her after we spoke again. Um, uh, I did. I, I did talk to an old friend this week. Um, uh, yeah. How about Martin Davidson? Oh yes, yes. And uh, do you recall being president of the German club? No. Oh, where was that? In? <laughs> this was in high school. Well, I don't recall that. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's a couple of other things I'm sure you don't recall that I'm about to tell you. Uh, as we were yeah. talking, he happened to be in his study, and he reached yeah. across and he pulled out the yearbook. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, look up Dave's name and see what's underneath. And, and, and it said, uh, the first thing, it, well, it said president of the German club, <laughs> track three and four, <laughs> the math club, no doubt, the swimming club, the athletic dance committee. I the couldn't have been on that. <laughs> I think you've got it wrong. No, he's reading it right from the book. They must have muddled it up. In fact, and then the next thing was the stage crew. No, I never was. You see, I, they must have mixed me with somebody else. Uh huh. And then finally was the commencement announcement committee. No, I was never on any of those. I uh, think he's got it most. Well not at all, because what what follows is quite specific. Yeah. Under under the picture, under Bohm, in quotes, it says Einstein. No, then, but I meant all those details. I understand. I know, but he was just reading from the book. That's what's what's interesting. Yeah. I mean, so he, now underneath it says Einstein, right? And then beneath that it says deep-sided intelligences, ideas, atoms, and influences. Hmm. Now, I, you know how people write in these books? You know, yeah. good luck and everything. Well, on your picture and underneath that, in your writing... <laughs> you crossed out the word, the name Einstein, and you put Steinmetz in. Oh. <laughs> I can't recall doing that. I know, I know. So I, I know, of course, I'd heard the name Steinmetz. I wasn't too familiar with it, so I went into the encyclopedia to find out why Steinmetz. And, of course, he did a lot of work in, in uh, electrical innovations. Yeah. But the interesting thing is that he left Europe. Actually, he was he was bounced out of Europe in the late 1800s because of his political leanings. He was a socialist. Oh. And when he came.
strength of this country, he was fairly active. In fact, he ended up being the head of the uh, uh, public education committee in, in, in a town like uh, Schenectady or something, the head of the, the educational board, but it remained very, very active as a socialist. So if you go back to that time, that year was 1935, and you were how old, 17, 18? Well, yeah, so you can see that you were looking around for your <laughs> influences, as they said, even then. I, 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 I was real pleased to hear that, that Mr. Davidson uh, evidently you know, keeps all of this very close to him. Uh, he did mention, by the way, that, that he tried to reach you a year or so ago in England and was unable to do so. I wasn't there. Yeah, and he also told me uh, that he, when I mentioned I was going to see more at Rice, that he had just returned from the funeral of Mort's brother's wife. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've heard of that. You, you knew that, the Doris? Uh, well, no, I called up Mort Wise because uh, uh, his wife had died in November. He wrote me a letter, which I never received. Right, which I told you about, yeah. And so I, I called him up and he told me about that. Oh, so you've talked then. Well, that's yeah. Good. That's good. So I got that. I also found a, a, a very, very interesting source for the, for the film. Apparently there's a, a, an organization, obviously, called the Wilkes-Barre Historical Society. And the Wilkes-Barre Historical Society has a lot of footage from the 30s of that whole area. In fact, the people that I talked to uh, did a... Uh, award-winning documentary that covered the entire country at that time called Children of Poverty that zeroed in on that era and much of the footage was the footage from Wilkes-Barre. So uh, were we to, you know, as, as you're talking about that period, we have a wonderful source of visuals that would enhance whatever it is that's being said at that time. I was rather pleased to stumble across that. I've not sent you the books yet, and I'm sorry about that. I promise you I'll send them tomorrow. I'm waiting for a letter. Of the, I, I don't know if you remember, but Sheldon Rockman said that they were going to send us a, a letter of intent, which I know he's, you know, he has, he, he's real honest about it, and very good about it. They have been deluged. Evidently, they're growing very, very quickly. And uh, a couple of his people have been in Europe this week uh, making connections there with respect to distributing the Mystic Fire catalog in Europe as well, and uh, he's just been, he just hasn't been able to sit down and finish writing the letter. I told him I was going to be calling you today, and I would really appreciate having uh, the letter so that I can send it along with the books. If the letter doesn't get here by tomorrow, uh, I've reprinted the one book, uh, which I told you about, the Arquanta Real, the one, the uh, Galilean Dialogue. It's a very small book. It's nothing that can't just quickly glance at. And I'm also sending you the actual copy of No Ivory Tower so that you can look through that as well, as well as your leisure. And uh, hopefully I'll get it. I've been trying to get it all done so that when I go to Los Angeles on Tuesday, I can be free to just kind of concentrate on why I'm going there and not drag things along from here. And consequently, things have gotten a little, a little crowded. But we'll do what we can. Um, uh, other, other than that, uh, I really, you know, as I said, I would be calling you today. Um, a, a thought did cross my mind, by the way, David, and uh, I wanted to pass it by to you. Um, these conversations on the phone have really been very, very, very informative and excellent, obviously. Uh, it occurred to me that although we had talked about the possibility of my coming over with Sheldon and his wife in August, perhaps, uh, barring any other strangenesses, uh, to do something, to begin the filming, it occurred to me that maybe a preliminary uh, visit by me, where I just came over and not get in your way at all, but just sort of be around for three or four days, and it, at your at your leisure, maybe we could do, do the, some preliminary talking there so that I, I get things in order um, and, and then come back and um, he's asked me to write out a, uh, a one-page overview of the project as I 
I see it now, which I've begun to do, and which I explained to him when I've done that, I first have to give it to you, to, to show it to you. He's looking around for possible uh, means of funding all of this. So uh, hopefully that's what I'm going to be doing when I go to Los Angeles. I'm going to write that page or so of the way it seems to be right now, the, the way the project can be approached. And uh, I will... Do you have access, by the way, to a fax machine? Out there? Well, there is one in uh, the university. I don't have that number at the moment. Okay. It might, if, if, if it crosses your mind to get that, that number, it would probably facilitate things because I don't have one, but most people do have one. Certainly Sheldon has one. And I, here you've always got access to a fax machine. And if it's necessary to just get a couple of pages to you, or, or vice versa, it really does accelerate the process. Yeah, except that I haven't been going in much to the university. You really have? Um, because my colleague is not there. He's away. Basil, that highly you mean? Yeah. Uh-huh. Might to equally send it by express or something, you know. Yeah. To our home address. I mean, I don't think you know, the delay will be serious. Okay. All right. In fact, what the, this next package I send you will be sent that way. And I'd like you to mark how much time it does take to get there, uh, as opposed to just regular mail. Um, I've well, looked... Forgive me, go ahead. No, I, I, uh, yes, I talked a bit with Joe. You did? Okay. Yeah, and, and you see, it seems to me, you know, that while it would be good to bring in dialectical materialism as part of the uh, evolution of my thoughts and so on, mm -hmm. you know, to go into all the um, McCarthy would not be advisable. I think Melville feels that way too. That people really won't understand it, and also that uh, uh, it's only a very small part of this McCarthy idea. You know, if you really wanted to get it right, you need a lot of research. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, uh, so yeah, the thing is that would be sort of on the side, you know. Uh, but the idea would be the development. Yeah, I, I would say having started with materialism, I think we discussed this. Mm -hmm. The dialectic was the first move away from that rigid, rigid materialism. Mm -hmm. uh, it sort of moved on. And in Bristol, I was beginning to look at various other people like Ospensky and Gurdjieff and eventually Krishnamurti and so on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as I recall, the, go ahead, please. I was yeah, just going to say that, it, that, as I recall, the dialectic thing happened in Israel. Is that correct? The, the well, uh, it, it, it started, my interest started even in America, but uh, in Israel, uh, it started in Brazil, there was this fellow, Meyer Schoenberg, who put me in, and we discussed the dialectic further, and he suggested Hegel. Mm -hmm. In Israel, I met somebody who was really knew Hegel, uh, Meshulam Grohl, we had a lot of discussions. Mm -hmm. And I studied it. I continued to study Hegel for quite a while after that. And at that t up until that time, did you perceive what was going on more, and, and I don't know if you can even make a dichotomy of this nature, but was it more political activation as opposed to philosophical? I well, mean, no. Uh, I think that it was always philosophical in a way, but uh, the uh, thing was also involved in the politics. Yeah, I mean, but it, the tenor of the times was such that it would have colored it even more uh, from the outside, not, not, yeah. see, the, the nice thing is that uh, one can trace the inner journey uh, rather clearly, but the, the way it expresses itself to the outside world, it expresses itself, for example, it can all be spiritual, and yet, in, in, in one era, that spirituality can be called mysticism. In another era, it could be called politics, and yet the inner the inner need to uh, the so-called flame of discontent, as Kay would say. Yeah, well, I think that you see, I was always interested, even in high school, uh, in politics because that was a period, you know, in the thirties when there was a great deal going on, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, there was uh, the New Deal, and fascism in Europe, and so on, and uh, the danger of war. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, uh, I think that uh, until I got to Caltech, I felt that the democratic approach in the West would somehow meet these problems, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but as the war began to develop, and I felt the Europe was caving in to the Nazis, you know, and there was a lot of pro-fascism all around. Mm -hmm. I began to doubt that, you see. Mm -hmm. uh, I began to doubt that, uh, see, that, that uh, how to put it, 
Forgive me, yeah. when you say the first hint, was it because of the, the changing, the, the darker picture coming, taking well, over? Well, that was it, and also I could see that this science that's done at Caltech was very limited and narrow and uh, was more like a business enterprise. Right? Mm -hmm. That it wouldn't be concerned with any of this at all. It would only be concerned with getting, it looks that way, getting results. But in fact, isn't wasn't that a carryover from the classical period? Where well, it's still carrying over this notion about getting results. I mean, we're talking about real early in the game. In fact, in the piece that I'm writing, that I, you know, I, I talk about the last 50 years, yeah. and that when you graduated, uh, quantum theory was uh, it's still in its infancy, no doubt. But, but then well, it, was, it was not. You know, it was not noticeable at that time that it was all that different. I see. I see. It's not to me. I mean, I think most students just it, it hadn't penetrated very far. It only began to penetrate. Uh, see, uh, uh, there are a few places like Oppenheimer where they really were doing it. And, uh, in Caltech, they had one course in quantum theory. You see, a rather poor elementary course. Mm -hmm. Were you were you apprised of quantum at that time? I mean, like, did you know, for example, anything at all that it, it existed when you were in high school? Had you read it? Yeah, yes, but I'd read about it. It's on Bohr orbit and so on. But the, the general way it was going, I didn't, you know, it was only very, you got only a smattering of the things. I see. I can see why. Yeah, of course, no one right now. Yeah, <laughs> well, but see, that's, that's the train I think is interesting, watching the actual development of, the, of, of this and special relativity. It's interesting that in 1935, you're graduating and they say Einstein, who was in place by then, had uh, had been become a, an international figure, and even the, uh, the the high school kids knew about him. You know, just oh, yeah, everybody knew about Einstein. Yeah. yeah, and I guess he but did. They knew about him in the twenties. He was a very well popular figure. Right. Uh, the, the, the Bohr was also. I mean, did they know about Bohr? Bohr was not that well known. No. no, he wasn't. So that that didn't happen until when would you say? Well, I don't know when. I mean, Bohr never became as well known as Einstein. Oh, I'm sure, but. Speaking. Well, I think that be Go ahead, please. it's hard to say. It was after the war, people got to know a little bit more about this, but uh, uh, see, Einstein was the one who struck, who sort of affected the public. Mm -hmm. Is there, by the way, but this is an aside, but is there a particular philosophy of science book I can... Uh, I can't think right now. I mean, okay, please continue with your story. I'm sorry. So, uh, so when you got to Caltech, there was this one teacher who knew a little bit about it. Yeah, well, he, there was a course, and that was, but I mean, it didn't go very far, you see. I see. I see. Uh, it was really a, but today it would be called a, a, a very elementary course of first year at university, you see, but we had it in graduate school then. Mm -hmm. And I guess the atomic era brought that into the foreground, I would assume. Yeah. Yes, I mean, it was after the war, people began to teach courses in it, you see. And I, Oppenheimer was teaching already in Berkeley and I one see. of the who was teaching advanced courses in America in advanced courses. And essentially that's what drew you to Berkeley? Well, no, I, I, what drew me to Berkeley was that uh, uh, I had a relative who uh, was working there at Pasadena and he was on a fellowship, you know, postdoctoral, and he um, knew Oppenheimer and he, Oppenheimer came down one the year there and mm -hmm. he introduced me see, to so that Oppenheimer offered and went and said he would try to get me a, an assistantship at the Berkeley. I see, I see. And at that time, uh, I mean, this is a toughie, but, but your your intellectual uh, setting was what? I mean, you, you weren't satisfied with that with that, that that was being said, essentially. Well, I mean, that Caltech didn't uh, satisfy me. It seemed, uh, you know, there wasn't much going on there that I interested. Uh, yeah. that, that was a, f a straight four-year course, was it? A four-year? Oh, no, that was a graduate course. So I see. I, got, I finished after I had just finished. Oh, Penn State and then Caltech, forgive me, of yeah. course. I see. And how long were you at Caltech? Two years. Two years. And then, uh, go ahead, please. Well, then I went up to Berkeley and, uh, and, uh, you know, and there there were much more interesting. All, all these political things came in, you know, say that it was up 
obvious war was approaching and this fascism and all these questions. Uh, you see, I was really raising the question as to whether I had a feeling that our civilization was going nowhere. You see that I remember once having a feeling that maybe it was declining and that one would get to the kind of quietism that you had in the East. You see. Mm-hmm. But really, this sort of enterprising spirit wouldn't continue because uh, uh, it was, you know, it, it had no real hope. You see, I felt that uh, uh, you know, that people weren't had sort of given up on the idea that society would get any better. I think I used to get a lot of uh, energy by talking about society earlier and you know, how it might get better. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you spoke with Einstein, uh, with uh, Oppenheimer about these, the, the movement of society... Uh, but I didn't talk with him very much. You no, didn't? I, I talked with these other people like Roman and Weinberg. Oh, right, of course. I see. Um, maybe a few others. Then. I see. And then wh- while you were at Berkeley, uh, who put you in touch with the Princeton, with the, uh, the, the Princeton operation, actually? Which, what Princeton? Well, the Einstein and, and, and that aspect of it, or going to well, Princeton. Oh, no, that only came much later. Oh, it did? I see. Yeah. So, so you were with Oppenheimer at Berkeley for how long? Well, yes. Now, in the beginning, you know, we, you had to have the seminar there, and, uh, and I was working and talking with people, and, but then the work came in. I'd only been there a few months. Uh-huh. Uh, not long after that, Oppenheimer got highly involved in war work and became less accessible. Mm-hmm. Do you recall any of your own inner feelings regarding that? Well, it was uh, it sort of what, it was a kind of a nuisance. <laughs> it was somewhat disappointing, right? Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, but uh, 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 but I continued anyway, and. Uh, now, uh, with the Lomanets and Weinberg and a few others, it seemed that they had raised, that they were thinking of the possibility of a genuine transformation of society and the human being. Mm-hmm. Whereas, this, it seemed this notion had sort of, co- uh, sort of fizzled out mm-hmm. in the general society I knew, right? Right. You see, the America had had this dream of a just society of one where, uh, one where there would be freedom and uh, 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 at least the pledge allegiance to the flag, liberty, and justice for all. And, mm-hmm. uh, but there was a great deal of idealism in there, you know, about the, what the, the dream of a better society, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that there would be a gradual progress toward it. I see. Mm-hmm. And then when the war comes along... Uh, well, even a bit before, you see, I could see that uh, it was sort of fizzling out, you know. Mm-hmm. But, but what I was going to say was that when the war came along, at least on, on a conscious level here, it, it, it appeared to be the good guys against the bad guys. Yes, but uh, but I could see that uh, they were not going to was not going to change the fundamental situation. You see, the bad guys were there because the good guys had put them there, allowed them to get there, right? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And therefore, they were really highly divided in what they wanted, right? They half wanted what the bad guys. Mm, yeah, of course, of course. But that was clear to you at that point. I mean, there's, there's yeah. no doubt about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, I became open to this idea that maybe this communism would tra- transform the society and the individual and you know, create what's religious. See, I think that the American dream had been a dream of the whole of heaven on earth gradually developing. Right? Absolutely, yeah. Now, the, the, the idea was that the Russian dream was through, this would develop through revolution, right? Mm-hmm. And so, I suppose I was open to reconsidering that question because it seemed that this is the American Avenue was really never going to get there, right? Right. Now, <laughs> regarding that, the, the, the basis of materialism uh, is this notion of opposing opposites. Uh, the dialectical materialism. Yes. Um, the original, I would say originally the materialism was uh, just simply in the sense I accepted the materialism which is implicit in science mm-hmm. and in most of society that, that the basis is matter yes right? and it seemed following certain rules and laws and so on which you had to learn right right to master and if you could master those rules then you could produce and get rid of poverty and produce a good life and mm-hmm. uh, you know every, be healthy and uh, uh, in other words you, uh, to go towards your dream right right now then, uh, by, 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 by the 
capture some essentially uh, a material. I don't know what would ever happen at that point, but then mm -hmm. when I got to Berkeley, there, there were these people saying it could still happen in another way. I see. I see. But this was tied to a different philosophy and, uh, and still materialism, but this dialectical form, which was more vital, you see, and allowed for more transformation and so on, less rigid. Mm hmm. So that stayed, stayed with, that became the, the impetus, as it were, uh, for your perceptions. Now, I, I guess what I'm asking is that that could somehow, uh, where science was at that point, and may well yeah. still be, it seemed to corroborate that, that notion. Well, it still seemed open as a possibility that science could move that way. See, and that, the idea of the unity of opposites uh, was very much uh, struck by it. In the plasma work, I thought of the unity in developing the plasma uh, uh, thing, uh, were you doing any writing at the time along these lines? Uh, well, I didn't write anything specific, no, no. Uh, other than in my articles. In your article, uh, the no, actual... I wouldn't, in the physical review articles, I wouldn't have discussed it a lot. But you would have touched on it. But that's not the form. Right? But you would have touched on it, essentially. Possibly touched on it. Yeah. As I mentioned, you know that that aspect is, is is clear in the quantum theory textbook. That there's yeah. another another layer of, of thought. The unity of, of, of subject and object, there and so on. You see, I think that I regarded that as a dialectical principle, and I must have felt Bohr was reasoning in a dialectical way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When you uh, as a, what? When you when you when you came across that notion of that quantum was 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 uh, in a sense hailing the uh, indivisibility, the wholeness aspect of, yeah. of uh, materialism. That that essentially must have uh, strengthened the, the, the feeling. Yes, that has strengthened the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So now you're you're there, and it's uh, the beginning of the war. You, it's, it's the war started just a couple of months after you got there. You say. Yeah, that's right. And then there was Oppenheimer getting more and more unapproachable. Mm -hmm. and I was sort of concentrating on these friends of mine. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talked a lot of these things. The whole scene. Weinberg was very strong on Bohr as a uh, dialectical. Because it said that things were no longer rigidly fixed, that, uh, that the opposites could come together in a new synthesis at a higher level, and therefore there was still hope that for humanity, right? Right, and when you say at a higher level, how do you how how were you perceiving that higher level at the time? Well, well, more um, what shall we say, more coherent, orderly, you know, more greater scope and so on. You see, mm -hmm. thereby, in other words, approaching science that way, one could then develop uh, an understructure for the rest of society along those lines. Yeah, that's right. Uh, people could see that matter was that way. Society, these opposites would be, you 
ignited and hired to synthesis too, to say the individual mm-hmm. and the collective. Now, uh, allowing for individual freedom and yet collective uh, harmony, right? Right. So that takes us through uh, Brazil and, and, and Israel. Brazil and, and, and also getting back to England and Br- Bristol, I mean. Right, which is uh, where we I left mean, off. I continue to think about that for many years, I mean, after that, right? Uh-huh. Once you got to Bristol, was there any kind of dialogue going on with others? Or? No, there wasn't anything of that sort, no. No. I just read, I would read Hegel and think about it, but there was nobody to talk with. Oh, I see. The, the whole notion in England is very much against that. Uh, it's a more empiricist attitude. And what year would that be now? Where, where, where? 57, I got to back to England. I see. I see. And in fact, therefore, that letter that, that Melton has, where the, the paragraph that I mentioned regarding dialectical materialism was a direct consequence of your work with, with Schoenberg and, and his Yeah, interest. I was in Brazil, yes. And probably in, as I felt that it would have implications for society and for the individual to, that by changing this way of thinking, the whole thing could change. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. One of the things on reading Hegel was the sort of the thing only slowly dawned on me that Hegel was saying you've got to pay attention to thought itself. You know? mm-hmm. Not really what thought is thinking about, right? Yeah, but the process itself is. is it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That this was the dialectical process, which was the major process. Oh, I see. I see. Of course. Yeah, that it was the process which was a dialectical in nature. If, if the, 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 the properly. Dialectic thought was the crucial one. I see. I see. Because it would be no use thinking of dialectic in nature if you, if you didn't notice it in thought. Your thought would still be rigid, right? Mm-hmm. Of course. Of course. And is that what led you to Spensky? And, uh... Well, no. It's hard to know uh, what led me. I mean, I'd say when I got to Bristol, I felt again that uh, many signs that you see the, the science was going to lead I had wanted, right? Mm-hmm. It was going to, it was just uh, absorbed in the rest of the society and with its roles and its methods and its limitations, you know, and people wanting to get ahead and, you know, to arrive with each other and so on. Mm-hmm. But in other words, that I was gradually saying that scientists were caught up in this whole psychological, social thing as much as anyone else. And therefore, I began to get interested in something deeper into going into the, what's behind this.
ever see a, a relatively visible individual in England? No, no, I, I didn't know anything about him, you see. He mm -hmm. wasn't coming there because he was ill. And oh, of course not. He came yeah. only a bit later, you see, in 61 when I first met him. And how did that come about? Well, I wrote a, I, I found, I wrote to the uh, people in Ohio and they referred me to the committee and got married to Doris Pratt, you know. Oh, yes. And she said, well, he's coming to London to give some talks and I came there and Finally, I wrote and asked if I could talk to him, and she said, okay. Do you recall anything of those original conversations that are in any particular uh, thing? That well, uh, not in detail, no, but I mean, we could talk about it later. You know, that's a little hard to do this. Sometimes. Sure, sure. Uh, so essentially, that, that uh, relationship began. Uh, in the meanwhile, you had, you had zeroed in on this higher order of... Uh, uh, this is a layman's sta uh, uh, point of view. Were you trying to work out some mathematical explanation of that at the time? No, what I was trying to work out a, an ontology or you know, a cosmology which would be compatible with that. I was trying to work also with dialectic to, to work out a cosmology. Mm -hmm. I can't just remember how I, what I said, but uh, well, cosmology where everything would be flowing. I see. I see. If we were to do a little, a little uh, work ourselves, could we, could we find some of those earlier? Well, I don't think I wrote them up. You see, uh, it was just happening in, inside yes, you. Yes, but there was, uh, there was something, and in, in, by about '62 or three, I there, there are a couple of articles, and I, I gave my inaugural lecture at Berkeley College, which had that cosmology in it. Uh huh. It developed these things. I see. But you can get the spirit of the thing. Absolutely, absolutely. So when did Birkbeck take place? 61, you say? That, that 61, you, yeah. 61. Uh, once you got there, uh, what what was your actual... You had, were you teaching by then? Is that what you were primarily... Well, I was teaching. I was a professor, you see, at Birkbeck, and I taught some courses. In... In uh, physics, yeah. In physics. In quantum? Yeah. And... I included quantum. I mean, I mean uh, but... You see, uh, Again, I found when I got here that there was not an atmosphere that was at all favorable to the kind of metaphysics I was thinking of mm -hmm. anywhere in England, and uh, uh, you know, it, it was sort of discouraging. I, mean, I, I began to feel anyway that this it was generally true in physics that nobody really wanted to do this sort of thing. Right? Absolutely, yeah. So I got more and more discouraged and feeling that you know we're not going to get anywhere. Occurred to you to leave physics? Well, at that time, no, but it had occurred to me when I was in um, Berkeley mm -hmm. right after the war. You see, when, when people started coming back and they began to just put down equations, and if they were the truth, and say we just got to have these equations and calculate without having much physical concept. And uh, they didn't seem to see the need for that, and I began to think I could leave, should leave physics, but I couldn't think of what to do. You see. <laughs> but what I thought was. Uh, I would try to bring, since it was a dialectical idea, to bring together the two sides, the mathematical and the physical concepts, right? Mm -hmm. These two opposing sides in a higher in a synthesis. And I wrote my quantum theory book in that way. You know? I see. Okay. So again, that was another dialectical idea, I think. The idea was to try to, uh, uh, being faced with this, uh, with some people, you know, I mean, I say we want to do justice both in the mathematics and the physical concepts. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, by then, of course, you'd gone past uh, the Princeton uh, years, is that correct? Yeah, well, that's in Princeton, I, yeah. But, I mean, I began, it was toward the end of the Berkeley years, about 45, 46, I was thinking of leaving physics, you see, but I couldn't think of where to go. Right, right. So you stayed yeah. in physics. Uh, I, I, I stayed I, in I, physics and thought I would try to resolve this by bringing together these two opposites, right? Mm-hmm. And did, uh... When when you got to Princeton, I, I, when did the special relativity book get written? Do you recall? Oh, that came out much later when I was in uh, Berkeley. Okay, I, I've got that on order, by the way, at the public library. It just hasn't come in yet. And you you asked me to refer to the last chapter in which some of well, the appendix. The appendix. The appendix. I see. And in the appendix, again, there is a continuation of the of the the, the development of the idea that you're yeah. moving toward. I yeah, see. Well, by 
by there the idea had moved a long way towards uh, the notion of physics as perception, you see. I it see. Was effect, it was affected a lot by Krishnamurti saying that perception was primary. Mm-hmm. Perception through the mind. So. I see. I see. And the, 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 uh, the risk of leaping forward here, but uh, the notion of terms like implicate order and things of that nature, when did they actually just... Well, they began to come around, uh, you know, who knows, 64, 65, 66, I think we developed gradually. You know. I see, I see. And, uh, so when you, in your book, in the implicate order book, you know, you, you in the preface, of course, you, you mentioned the fact that this, uh, essentially, a culmination of the last 20 years of work. Yeah, yeah, well, some of the articles, you know, referred to there, but then it was that the thing started. Right, right. Now, when did Basil Harley come into the picture, actually? Well, he came to Berkeley at the same time I did, but we didn't get together immediately. It took a number of years gradually to establish the connection. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, uh, was that relationship a, a, a means by which uh, what was being uh, perceived on your part could, could be translated into mathematical well, we, to, to some extent, yes. I mean, he, uh, we, we discussed it and he, he criticized and so on. See, and, uh, so it, it, it helped. Mm-hmm. Now, Martin Davidson referred to a, an article in The New Scientist. Yeah. Which he has a copy of. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, you're familiar with that particular article? Yeah. Now, when did that happen? Oh, that was in the 80s. Oh, it was that late. I see. Yeah. I see. So between the 60s and the 80s, this, this notion that you're developing, uh, did you have an opportunity to, to either speak on it or write on it? Uh, well, I've written you know, a number of articles on it. You see, and, uh, I used to speak here and there. You see, I didn't get much resonance from physics. I wouldn't speak to philosophers or to, or even to architects or to various sorts of people. Mm-hmm. And did you, what kind of feedback were you getting at that, at that time? Well, them. I mean, we got a, well, I mean, I found some interest among the others, you see, that's not, not a, but there's very little feedback from physicists. They, they didn't appreciate it. I see, I see. They <laughs> couldn't see the reason why I was even doing it. Hmm. And essentially, that, that is a, a basic problem even now, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so you can say that, uh, I mean, I was gradually discovering that the way I want to do physics has very little uh, uh, response, you know, from the physics community. It, it, it meant either going over to their way or sort of going on by, by myself, right? Mm-hmm. So you almost had no choice but to continue doing what you had to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what, once the, the connection with, with, with Krishnamurti took place, did that accelerate the process, did you find? Yes, it did, yes. Now, I wanted to add one point that, you see, it was the, the, the difficulty in getting my work received was not primarily political. You see, the tradition in physics was that left-wing people's ideas could be li- listened to, you see. Mm-hmm. There were quite a few. Oppenheimer was one of them, for that matter. In fact, and yeah. Here, and, uh, uh, but with Krishnamurti, it was, uh, they said I was moved toward mysticism, and that was really what turned them against me. Uh, I, mean, uh, I see. I see. Right? And they went on record to say that such was the case. Uh, yeah, what I meant that I'm not, I say it was inevitable. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that I resented or regretted it anyway. Right, it certainly but was inevitable, right. And yeah, it was just, uh, at that time I felt that this Krishnamurti thing was more important to me than physics. I see. So I said, whatever consequences it has in physics, I must uh, take them. You see. I see. And uh, later on, the, the convocation that you had, in Brockwood, where, where you, the scientists were invited. Yeah, but they were just, they were sort of people on the fringe, you know, people who were, they were not really the establishment scientists. I see, I see. Um, and then how, how were they chosen? Were there people that you knew? Oh, those I knew, those other people, those 
Uh, did anything of consequence take place as a result well, of I it? I don't think it did, you see. Uh, um, I think uh, well, that's a thing we ought to discuss carefully, but I don't think that, you see, uh, I don't think Kay wanted to uh, talk in the way that scientists generally do. I, say it was, I said everybody should have a chance to say a little about it. I right. So I yeah. got very bored with that. Yeah, so I, I remember. <laughs> Yeah. 
feeling is that, that I, I'm not I'm not entirely sure of that. Uh, for example, and it's for, just maybe for different reasons, but the Cushing article, for example, suddenly coming out and the whole uh, reappraisal of the causal approach. Um, it, it would seem that it's 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 beginning to get into the flow, as it were, of, of you know. Well, maybe I, mean, I don't know how much. There is some interest now among the philosophers of science here at Cambridge and Oxford. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, maybe a little more interest among scientists, but you know, it takes a while. It takes a while. It takes a while. Okay. Well, uh, what I what I'd like to do, if I may, is is write up that page or so of uh, the general overview of the content of. of and, and pass it on to you for you to comment. Yeah, no, you see, the other point is to say my, although we shouldn't discuss it right now, my interest in thought, when the nature of thought, uh, starting with Hegel and going on with K. Yeah, very, very important. In fact, uh, you may recall that in my letter to you, uh, I, I suggested that that, uh, that might be a, the general underlying approach. Yeah. And, and, and if I may, I mean, I go back to that childhood experience of yours of trying to run across the book, uh, the brook, that even then you were sort of paying attention to the way it takes place in yeah. the mind, and that you found that the thinking process fell short with respect to your accomplishing that which you set out to do. Would that be a clear statement? Well, you could say that was a foreshadowing, you know, an anticipation of something. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was a, a, a trend in that direction, but you see, the major, it didn't t play a major part in what I was doing, you see. No, in fact, lying. I guess what, what, I, what I'm saying, David, is that uh, as you, at, from that point, you were beginning to recognize the limitations of that which we just implicitly take for granted as the way things work. And by actually observing yourself in in, in operation, you saw there, there's got to be some other level of taking. Yeah, that, in a way, that was the first step for this idea of dialectic again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Saying that the, the state of transformation, or that the fundamental state was the state of becoming, of transformation, of you know, mm -hmm. movement, right? Right. And that the, the various forms, the, the static forms, are really in that. You know that. Than absolutely. absolutely. So essentially, what I'm saying is, and last night I was rereading the last chapter of, or the next to last chapter, well, the, one of the final chapters in the Wholeness book, in which you're talking and you're giving as an example uh, the listening to an appreciation of music, mm -hmm. and how this is an example of how the, the, the bulk of it actually takes place implicitly. Yeah. Uh, rather than note by note, something else is happening at some other level. Which yeah, I think that the idea of an implicit order mm -hmm. was there in crossing the stream, too. Ex yeah, the idea one was that that, that, that movement was... The, so that, that's my point, that it, if, if, yeah. if, if the whole film, book, whatever it is, took that course... Yeah, now you could say, for example, what Hegel says about dialectic, that they, there's being, non-being, you know, shows the two are equivalent when you look at the most general sense. Mm -hmm. The pure being and pure non-being are equivalent. Therefore, they pass into each other, you see, and that passing into each other is becoming, right? Oh, right, right. Uh, I think I saw there that there were the states of being, being on the rock, being on one side, being on the other. Mm -hmm. right? And the idea that you were, the synthesis was, was the state of, of becoming, which was also implicit, you know, it was hold of it. Couldn't get hold of it, right. And that, so it was a kind of foreshadow of both dialectic and the implicit order. And the, that's probably why dialectic appealed to me, that, that the minute I said dialectical materialism, it appealed to that vision. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but you get my, my point about possibly using the, the uh, implicit aspects of or just pursuing the thinking process aspect of, of yeah. All of this using so the idea was then that even in your internal uh, processes of the same nature, you see, I don't know if I really had that at the time, but I may have you know, to say that the internal process of thought going between one thought and another is of the same nature. Certainly, I had that idea when I wrote the quantum theory book. You, you did, in fact, and, and there is a, a very clear statement about that, and and you talk.
work in yeah. terms of quantum leaps, that yeah. this may in fact be where the leap actually takes place. Yeah. Nice. So it was sort of developing, and I, I must have had it, you know, in, there in the background. Mm-hmm. Uh, you see, it was a move away from the idea of uh, everything dealing with well-defined states of being formally defined. And, you see, that was partly my objection to the extreme formalism that physics was taking, you know, or was taking on, right? Mm-hmm. They, they were just static, rigid forms of equations. Right. Right. By which they tried to capture the movement. Right? right. So then, would it be fair to state that with the reading of Hegel, who said, "Pay attention to the thinking process," you started to relinquish the uh, possibility, which you pretty much had relinquished anyhow, of anything happening on a on a real on a material p- political level? Any yeah. I mean, there were so many factors pointing that way, and but um, it was all moving that way to say that this thinking process was underlying the whole thing. I think that that was clear when mm-hmm. we began to look at Hegel. It was not merely that Hegel was telling you how to think about the world, mm-hmm. but that he was telling you how to think about thinking. <laughs> right. And now, how to look at thinking, right? How to pay attention to it. Right? Now, mm-hmm. now, when these perceptions started taking hold, did you ever have the opportunity to talk to people like Ross or Joe about it? No, that was already later, you see. Uh, much later. And I, I, I was not able to yeah, the, the first uh, step was really Mario Schoenberg. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had, well, he, uh, well, he, um, yeah, I'd been writing a book about, uh, I was writing Causality and Chance of Modern Physics, and I'd been writing uh, about causality, and uh, he read the thing, and he objected, saying, you know, that I had a very rigid view on causality, you know, metaphysical, right? Mm-hmm. So he, he, he suggested this view of causality, you know, of, of necessity and causality and chance together, right? I see. Which was dialectic, you know. Right. So, uh... Now, in that... that, in that he suggested reading Hegel, which I did when I got to Israel. Now, so you were writing the book, Causality and Chance, at that point? In, I started it in Brazil, you see. I see. Um, I got a large part of it done in Brazil. That's the other book I have to find. I, I, yeah. The only one that they have in the library is they have yeah, one copy. See, there, there I emphasize the, the notion of causality and chances and necessity and contingency as dialectical opposites. I see. Also, continuity and discreteness. I, I think several of them. You see, that's another thing that I was very interested in. Continuity and discreteness, I see. Yeah. And, and, and how would you, you uh, d- define that, those two, in, in these terms? Well, uh, the continuity would be this flow. Right. I see. The idea is that they are in this relationship with one, you know, in this uh, relationship with unified opposites. Right. Now, I have a problem with the term discrete because to me it means uh, hidden. Now, discrete means just simply apart. You see, it means cut apart, literally. I see. Apart. The integers are discrete and the real numbers are continuous. You see, between any two integers are discrete and separated. Oh, right. But there's a continuous number set of numbers in between, right? I see. I see. Uh-huh. Now, that particular book was, how was that received? Well, it, it got some reviews, some good reviews, I don't have many, see, from um, philosophers and so on. Well, once again, physicists made no attention that I know of, because uh, some may have, but at least it didn't make much of a stir among them, because I, I don't think they saw why you should bother to, to, to even think about those things. I see. I see. I felt the main point was to get equations and experiments, and there you are, you see. Now, th- th- forgive me, did that book get written prior to special theory? Oh, yeah, long before. Long before. Now, and once you got to special theory, was there a reason for you writing that book, following this line of thinking that we've been talking well, about? No, well, uh, the reason I wrote this special theory was that uh, somebody had asked me to write such a book, you know, they were making a series, right? Oh, I see. And in, in the context of that book, were any of these uh, notions introduced uh, other than well, in the, the appendix? The notions, I think they were introduced when it came to that appendix. I see. Did you ever talk in terms of the indivisibility aspect of it uh, at that time? No, not there, no, no. No, I see. So it wasn't until later that, certainly in the, in the, in the wholeness book, you yeah. mentioned the, the specific fact that that 
seems to be the only two things, the only thing that, that quantum and special relativity have yeah, in yeah. common. Uh, now, is, would that be considered a revolutionary statement? Perceiving? Well, I think physicists would say, why bother making a fuss about it? See, the main point is to have the equations, and you can talk about them in a lot of different ways. But it, uh, see, like when I was in Princeton, people at the Institute for Advanced Study would say, all that sort of talk is like window dressing or uh, icing on the cake. The main icing. point is the cake, which is the equations, right? Okay, so essentially then, can I draw a parallel to what we're saying and using the thinking process as an example, that they're saying, why are we talking about implicit thought when it's the thinking process itself that's what's making things happen? No, they, they wouldn't even bother to think about thought. They're saying they're only interested in equations telling us how experiments are going to go. No, I understand that, but what I'm saying is in the development of what we're doing with the book and the yeah. film, if, if, yeah. if we subtly introduce that parallel early on, and, yeah. and that when, when, for example, after the war they come back and they're just doing equations, you still have that, that feeling that there's, yeah. that, that their eyes in the room, their eyes on the room. Yeah, that's, that's on the surface, you see. The equations can make give us uh, 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 information about something deeper. Mm -hmm. So that essentially, and, and you do have some wonderful visual representations of what we're talking about now in, in the book and in other books and in other talks that you've given that uh, sh show the limitations of our perceptions. Uh, the, the fish yeah. tank and things of that nature, uh, the, the the aspect of music, uh, for example. Uh, so, so essentially, what I'm saying is that if properly mapped out, the, the the flow of the film and book could, could introduce the, the the reader to a step by step uh, explanation. Essentially, the much the way it, it, you were introduced to it, the way it happened yeah. in your own in your own. Yeah, we well, could say that this flow was an example of the idea that we're talking about. This, that the idea itself flowed in the way which is the idea, which is the meaning of the idea. Right? Well, that's a wonderful point. That's exactly the point. So that uh -huh. that essentially could be the theme of yeah. of the whole. The idea is very is, is deeply self-referential. so that the outcome of, of, of the project could be such that it poses the question as to, you know, that, that should in fact uh, we continue, that we are almost compelled to pay attention to the other, because the one that, the, the, the present model just isn't working. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah probably, uh, if I go way back, I have the feeling uh, in the child or another, wasn't really right in society or anywhere, mm -hmm. but that it would get better, you know, that people could do something right. Yes. Mm -hmm. and I remember in the 30s, the Depression, we had a civics teacher who was very enthusiastic about America. Mm -hmm. and she, she said, of course, things are bad now, but it's only temporary, you know. Right. Uh, uh, sort of, I believe, she said, I said, okay, that's it's only temporary. We're going to get over this and go ahead. Mm -hmm. So you see it turned out, you know, that the only the war got us out. And after the war came that very that period where it was prosperous, but it didn't mean anything. You see, that the, just the sort of rubbing thing. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Ab more money, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And there are those who are suggesting uh, that as a result of the 80s, that, that that whole notion where greed became so so visible and pervasive, and in fact our, yeah. our heroes were those people, that... that that has at least come to an end. <laughs> yes, I heard Alastair Cook on the radio, on the radio this morning saying exactly that. that uh, new books are coming out which are attacking all this stuff about greed and so on. Right, right. So uh, that, it seems the 90s may be a period when people go and, and uh, sort of turn away from that. Right, and, and if, if what you're saying is correct, that they're just going to turn away to another form of it unless there's an introduction to... Yeah. Well, you see, but this this idea of the dream of heaven on earth is just the other. The dialectic would say this is the money grubbing and the heaven on earth are two sides of the same thing. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Cook is a, is a very interesting uh, gentleman. Do, do you know him? No. Oh. Uh, interesting observer of the past.
embarrassing scene, I would think. Did, did he did he let on that he, he questioned whether it was going to happen or? or well, when he sort of said that he, he referred to some book you know has come out, and he said that there's a sort of a change going on. People are looking on the Reagan hair. He's not so wonderful. Right. Did you did you have an opportunity to look through the book I gave you when you were leaving the the, the book on the, the economics and the quantum theory? The, 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 did you remember that? George Gilder's book, uh, in which he says that uh, that the major change in, in the 20th century was uh, the, the the lessening of the importance of matter, and he uses as a, as a frame of reference the fact oh, that, yeah. that the, com- the the countries that are evolving are those who have the least amount of uh, land mass, but are are uh, functioning in the, the processing of information. Yeah. And then he, he his his parallel is the fact that at the, the sub quantum level, uh, matter is, is uh, information. That it, that it is it is primarily information, and then it, it manifests into matter, and then matter is what we're using. Yes. Does that make any sense? Well, it's a way of looking at it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, this whole notion of of information at that base level, I know you touch on it also with respect to uh, electrons and uh, or particles having some. I hate to use the word knowledge, but some awareness of of, of what is going on, and that's essentially what makes them do what they do. Um, that being the case. Strengthen the implicit picture. Yeah. Again, the uh, the reason I'm saying that is because that, that's, that's the way the way I'm earning my living right now <laughs> is to suggest that that's happening here in, in the healthcare field, and that. Yeah. Well, that, there may be some changes going on here. Yeah. It, it, it but appe- I, I think that, that maybe the film would be opportune and. See, we have to get to some deeper level or else we'd be jumping from one opposite to another. You see that? Wonderful. Yeah, that's exactly the point. And that the, the, the deeper level, the, the one can point to it rather than, than actually yeah. um, define it or describe it. And it's, it's the paying attention to that deeper level that could conceivably make the transformation come about. So essentially, that's the, that's what I'm going to try to write in a page. That that is the the, the basic theme of the film, and that it. Uh, 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 yeah. Well. The the the, the I I've been toying or fooling around with with titles, and I know that they're they're really insignificant at this point. But uh, one of the things that I I, I, uh, I I wrote down on a piece of paper was. Uh, I know you're going to be a little reticent about this, but that's the way it's coming out. Is the first thing in the title is your name, well. and then uh, it would be exploring the eternal frontier. Uh-huh. David Bohm colon exploring the eternal frontier. Well, we can think about it anyway. Okay, I just thought I'd pass it on. Like I said, these yeah. are just notes that I've scribbled. But it seems to to point to that which we're talking about today. That that essentially, uh, it's been the basic interest in, in consciousness that you've always had, and uh, it's uh, what, what what its implications are that have led you to where you are right now. Yeah. Well. That's that's essentially it, and that term implicit then sort of does its own work in in explaining what's going on, and then also points to the implicate order, which we then go on to define as best we can. So that's essentially uh, where we are right now. I'm really looking forward to to the trip uh, to to California, because I'll get a chance to speak with Joe, you know, about, about certainly about this conversation and about the others. And uh, see if we can't get something down on paper that will make sense. Yeah, now, yes, uh, 
I think uh, before we, we stop, I, uh, there was somebody, I don't know if I told you about uh, George and Miriam Yevick. Uh, also, I, I had a lot of talks with them and uh, correspondence with her. So they're I, in Atlanta? Uh, they're somewhere in the south. No, they're in uh, New Jersey, Leonia, New Jersey. Oh, is that right? Oh. Leonia, New Jersey. See, I just have his name on my list. I don't have a, a general address. Leonia, New Jersey. Oh, well, that's yeah, great. Yeah, because I was finding the phone book. Uh, uh, Yevick is Y-E-V-I-C-K. And his wife's name? Miriam. George and Miriam Yevick. Oh, uh, forgive me. I'm thinking of Aronoff. George and Miriam Yevick. Now, is uh, uh, they are, are they scientists? Yes, yeah, so he's a physicist and she's a mathematician. I see. And has this been an uh, ongoing uh, relationship? Well, I had not for a long time, but while I was in, I knew them and I was an American, and they had a lot of correspondence, you know, and got to Brazil and a bit later, you know, in Israel. Well, what I'll probably do then is, I was going to ask you, is there anyone else that I might try contacting in Los Angeles? I mentioned, of course, we're going to be seeing your relatives uh, a week from, well, yesterday, Saturday, we haven't. Uh, with the Burmans uh, on Saturday, and of course I'll, I'll also go down to Laguna to see more. Uh, I toyed with the notion of, of, of contacting Hockney also, and but I don't think it would add much. Okay, Joe I'm felt the same way. Huh? Yeah, in fact, Sheldon, uh, the Mystic Fire people were going to send me a film of his so that I would at least have some kind of. Yeah, well, maybe if you get a better idea. Of him, but yeah, I, I, I can hold off on that. Is there so anyone? You could get in contact with Biederman sometime. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly counting on that, and that'll be when I get back. Um, is, is there anyone else in the uh, Los Angeles area that comes to mind? Um, any of the uh, people? Uh, for example, I remember that that you, you did that series of dialogues with uh, Kay, and, and there were a couple of other people involved. It might have been a psychiatrist or. Uh, oh yeah. I'll get you his name. Uh, I don't know if it'll help. Oh, I'm sure I can get it through Joe. Hold, uh, hold on a minute. Okay. There's a fellow uh, from John Hitley, but he's, uh, meanwhile, he's become rather antagonistic to Krishnamurti. Really? Yeah. So if you talk to Joe first before you try that. Okay. Dare I ask why? <laughs> well, it's a long story. Joe can tell you, right? It's no okay. point in trying to explain it. All right. I will do that. Uh, so uh, Joe will know better. Okay. And the other thing I'm going to ask of Joe is that if he can, to bring along either uh, tapes or books of the other seminars that you've held. I was at, I think you've had three so far, I mean, uh, three years running or four years. I think it's three or four, I don't know. Right, and I've been at two, and I was just going to see if he can get, get his hands on some of the others that I just would go there's, through. There's, I think there are, there are three, uh, I mean, we made a record of two of them. Mm. Oh, I see. There, there are tapes of the first, and now the fourth is the, the, the last one. Right. They're making a transcript of that. Right, right. And that's the one that I was at also. Yeah, the, as I say, you know, as one goes through that, there are those, these little gems that one can go in and, and extrapolate and, 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 and somehow fit into all of this. Uh, there are, uh, I call them runs, as it were. I don't know if you got a chance to listen to the tape that I sent you, but the, that's essentially what, what, what started oh, my... Yeah my whole thinking along these lines, that when you got into how implicit thought works, it was very clear to us in the audience, because we could follow the process, and, and that's how I feel the, the project.
logic can work uh, as well, that it, it, it would be just the, the biographical aspect of it would be the, the means by which one could, could develop the, 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 the line of, of thought that has led you to this point. You follow? And, yeah. with, and with the discovery of, of all of this uh, uh, historical footage of the Wilkes-Barre area, it heightened feeling that, that the film can also do much along the same lines by giving a subtle uh, uh, feeling of the various periods that we're talking about, be it the 40s or the 50s or the 60s, etc., that there were other things happening uh, around the world that were coloring all the, all the aspects. From, if, if nothing else, your frustration with the way things were going. And, and your feeling that, that, you know, that we were looking in the wrong direction, that can be uh, subtly, uh, very dramatically uh, implied by the pictures that are being shown as we're, as we're talking. And, and in fact, that's our feeling is that a lot of what we get done will be done uh, with just your talking. You know, it won't have to all be filmed, but we will, we will lay it down audio tape and then fill in a lot of the pictures um, yeah. and make it a, a much less of a strain on you, you know, standing there and doing, and doing all of this, which is why I'm, I'm really seriously thinking of, uh, Sheldon, for example, told me that uh, his, uh, they sent his son over to, uh, to England through Air India and, and, and it wouldn't cost much more than these conversations have been costing us, so it might it might be to our advantage for me yeah. to come over. Yeah, for yeah. well, uh, let me say first, I want to get clear about whether I'm going to do the angioplasty in order to Absolutely. To that. Well, that's at the top yeah. of the page here. <laughs> so yeah. so uh, uh, I will get the information, that, as much information as I can, and we'll talk again during the week, probably from Los Angeles. Okay? Okay, right. Uh, in the meanwhile, you uh, hang in there. Please give my love to Sarah. I will, yeah. All right, and uh, we'll be talking right. in a few days. Right. Okay? Okay. Is there any other? Nothing else I can think of. Okay, well, that's great. Thank you again, really, David. Right. And we'll, we'll be talking again soon.